Good morning and welcome to First Central Presbyterian on this Father's Day weekend. Today we remember all of our fathers, grandfathers, uncles, and others who have loved us and nurtured us throughout the years. Our ushers are going to distribute the friendship pads, which if you would please sign and pass along to the other side of the aisle or of your row. <clears throat> I have a couple of announcements for this morning. Our first one is we have the inquirers class that is meeting in the mentor room uh, with Cliff Stewart. And, and in that class, if you've never been there before, it's a class that teaches us about our church and about the denomination. And I know that last bit can seem a little bit daunting and intimidating, but there was an Abilene Reporter News article written just this past weekend about our beloved Kevin Smith, the former director of Abilene Philharmonic. And he said, if anyone can make somebody Presbyterian, it's Cliff Stewart. <laughs> so go to the class, you might find yourself enjoying it and learning something too. Uh, the second class is the Churchwide Sunday School. Uh, today marked our third Sunday together, but if you missed it, do not worry. It, we would just be glad to have you. It is, it's a great combination of, uh, of lecture and table discussion uh, questions that we, we have come to enjoy these past few Sundays. And uh, we start off adults, children, youth, all together at 9.45, and we sing music for about 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And today we, we had a kind of a bluegrass group. That was really fun. There was a dulcimer and a mandolin. It was great. So if you weren't there this morning, come next week. You won't, be, you won't regret it. Uh, the other thing I want to draw our, your attention to is Vacation Bible School is happening July 29th through 30th this year. And it is open for children from pre-K to fifth grade. And registration is open. If you want a t-shirt, I encourage you to register now because those are going to go pretty quick. But we will take registration uh, throughout the rest of the week. Just, just bring your kids. We'll be happy to have you. The other thing I want to point out, the last thing, is we are taking uh, officer nominations for deacons and for elders. So there's a description uh, from our book of order about elders and deacons that talks a little bit about what makes a good deacon, what makes a good elder. So if you know somebody... Uh, that would fit that criteria well, just sign their name on, on this piece of paper and, and we'll, we'll go about that. That is all I have. There's a lot of other events and happenings at our church, but let's do what we've come to do this morning, and that is to worship God. call us to worship. In a world filled with violence and war, we gather together to celebrate the promise of peace. In a world filled with tyranny and oppression, we gather together to celebrate the promise of justice for all. In a world filled with hunger and greed, we gather together to celebrate the promise of plenty for all. Our hope is in the name of the Almighty God the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of heaven and earth.
gracious God, it is a privilege to worship you among this community of saints. May our praise be joyful, may our hearts be opened, and may we be ready to receive your word. We give you all glory and praise this day and forever. Amen. People tend to make two mistakes when we come to the confession of sin. The first is to underestimate the sin that remains in us. It's still there. It can still hurt us. The second is to underestimate the strength of God's grace, that God is determined to make us new. Let us now confess our sins uh, using the prayer in our bulletin followed by our silent prayers of confession together. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. We are a people divided against ourselves. We cling to the values of a forgotten and broken world. We chase after profits and pleasures that can never satisfy. We fail to speak out against the oppressors who enslave those who deem unworthy. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Ignite us with passion and give melody in our words so that we may sing of your reconciling love to all. Amen. God sent Jesus not to judge us, but to save us. God accepts both our courage and our fears. In the name of Christ, your sins are forgiven. Dare to accept the gift of a new beginning. Let us stand and praise God together. Please be seated, and I would invite our young disciples to come forward. Grace has a word to share with you this morning. Do I see any? Yeah, oh, there's a few here. Um, yeah, come on up, guys. Welcome to God's table. You can do it. <laughs> I'm so glad that you guys are here this morning, that your people have brought you here, and we are all part of God's family, so we're all here to worship together. I have a couple of items to show you guys this morning, and I'm hoping that after you see all of them, you might be able to guess who we're talking about today. So maybe wait until I've shown you all three before you tell me your guess, okay? My first one is a basket, and look, there's a little, can you see Luca? There's a little baby in the basket, and he's kind of covered up with some reeds so that he'll be nice and safe in this basket. Okay, then our second item, we have a fire, it's a burning bush. And so this person met God in the wilderness and God spoke to him at the burning bush and told him that his name was I am who I am. Okay, and then our third item is these pieces of blue felt, which they're like the Red Sea. And this person, God helped him to spread the waters apart so that the people could walk through on dry ground and they walked all the way into freedom. So do you guys think you know who we're talking about today? Who do you think, Olivia? Yeah, maybe. There's somebody in the Bible named Moses and that's who these objects tell us about. 
And so it's a great day for us to talk about Moses because Moses helped the people of God to go from slavery into freedom. And today, along with it being Father's Day, it's also Juneteenth, which is a special holiday when we celebrate when African Americans in the United States went from being in slavery to being free. And so if we think about people like Moses, who helped the people of God to be free, but we also can think about people in our own history, like Harriet Tubman, which people actually called her Moses because she helped the people to go into freedom too. And so today, I hope we can think about how important freedom is and how we can treat everyone with love and respect. So let's do a repeat after me prayer and the congregation is welcome to join in. Dear God, Thank you for freedom. freedom. Help us treat everyone with love. love. Amen. Amen. Okay, you guys can come to music and movement or the nursery. Lord. Open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The reading today is from Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue. I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your right hand and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone. Until your people pass by, Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. 
both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. A huge thanks to our choir and a very fitting song for, today, uh, for today's sermon. Startle us, O God, with your truth, and open our minds to your spirit, that we may be one with your Son, our Lord. Amen. As a, chi- as a child, I remember gathering at my grandparents' trailer every single Friday to be with my mother's very large and very loud family. There were, she had nine siblings, and there were about 30 cousins, 30 grandchildren altogether, so it was pretty big. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I never particularly liked going to my grandparents. For one, as I mentioned, we did it every single Friday. It did not matter what time of year it was, what major sporting event might have been going on. Heck, it could have been hurricane season and my grandparents still wanted us there. Secondly, and probably more importantly, my grandparents didn't have any air conditioning, which you might think, you know, tough it out. I lived in the Rio Grande Valley hot, humid, you did not want to be stuck in a trailer with 30 people in in the summer. And you would think that having AC in the valley would be a non-negotiable, but my grandfather would be quick to tell you otherwise. (laughs) To be fair, they did have one window unit in the living room, but he refused to ever turn it on because it cost too much money. (laughs) So there we were, we eventually would spill out into into this tiny makeshift patio that my grandfather had built for my grandma uh, when she became wheelchair bound. What I probably remember the most though and miss the most were the stories that my, my family told every time we were together. If you were there, you probably would have heard over and over again how my grandfather grew up in a small, fa- in a small farm in Perlitas 
You probably would have heard my aunts and uncles reminiscing about their migrant days when they would move from Texas to Florida, South Carolina, uh, Michigan every summer and talk about how they swear they lived in a haunted house when they were in South Carolina. <laughs> Maybe you would have heard the apocryphal story of how my great-great-grandmother protected her nine children from a rabid coyote, but more miraculously survived the bite from that coyote and didn't need a doctor or if she was completely fine. It was miraculous. If you were really lucky, though, in my opinion, you would have been there when my tia Mauricia and my tio Lupe, both very talented mariachi, strummed their guitar and led us in Un Dia La Vez, my grandparents' favorite hymn, that they always, which they always played every time they visited. For better or for worse, or no matter how serious or funny those stories are, those stories have stuck with me, as I'm sure a lot of your, your family stories have over the years. There's just something about stories and parables and songs that stick with us much, much longer than a lecture or finger-wagging from our parents ever could. And there's probably no Old Testament story more foundational to our faith than the one that Angela read so well earlier today. It's a dramatic story of bondage to liberation that I'm sure a lot of us remember fairly well. It starts off with Abraham, Father Abraham, in the desert, who is chosen by God and his descendants eventually moved to the land of Egypt, where they grew so big in number that Pharaoh decided to oppress them through slavery. But God heard their cries of oppression and sent Moses, the great liberator of the Hebrews, to go and, and he sent plagues and all these miracles and led his people to the Red Sea, where it split into two and collapsed on Pharaoh and his mighty men. The story was so magnificent and inspiring that it eventually inspired the events, or it took the events of the Exodus and turned it into the song that we read today. So I want to spend just a little bit talking about three things that we learn from this hymn, otherwise known as the Song of the Sea. First, like every good hymn, God can be found right in the center of it. The people of Israel were to share this song, not just to remember where they've been, but of the God who has been with them since the beginning. And if we look even more closely, you'll find that there's not even a mention of Moses, the great liberator of his people, the guy who spoke to a burning bush and witnessed the great plagues. This hymn would be quick to remind us that liberation alone comes from God. And while Moses is an active agent serving on God's behalf, it's God, God's self, who works that out. And remember, it says that it, it was God who freed them by the power of his hand, God who overthrew their adversaries, and God alone who made the waters pile up and congeal before Pharaoh. So what could the Israelites have learned by singing this song in their grandparents' tiny, humid tents. Maybe they were to remember that it's, like I said earlier, God alone responsible for their, for their liberation from slavery. Maybe grandparents sang this song to their young Israelite grandchildren to help them remember where they came from, their religion, and who was responsible to protect them. Maybe, though, grandparents needed to teach this hymn so that they themselves could remember never to turn back to the old ways or to lose heart or to go back to the gods of Egypt. Second, we are all invited to join in the singing. Right after the last line is sung, we see that it is Miriam, Aaron's sister and prophet, who immediately leads the congregation with singing by grabbing a tambourine. Miriam reminds us that it's not enough that these miracles just occur, that it's her hope that by learning and reciting and teaching this song, that we might be transformed in the process so that we might bring peace and justice to those around us, the same kind of peace and justice that was given to them from, from Egypt. We might wonder, though, why is it that this Exodus story also gets a song, too? Well, it's likely because Miriam's song acts as an invitation to, for us to remember all that God has done and to bring the past 
to bear on the present. The fact that it's repeated so soon after its premiere performance means that this song should be sung again and again and again. It's likely, too, because God knows that human transformation best happens not through lecturing or finger-wagging, but through music. It's like St. Augustine once wrote, He who sings prays twice. And I would suggest that human transformation best happens when through the playful entertainment of another reality. And what better way to playfully imagine what a reality could look like than joining together in song? But don't, don't take my word for it. I'm not very musically inclined. I stopped playing piano when I was about 10. It was terrible. But take the word of French composer Gabriel Faure, who wrote, to imagine is to formulate all that one wishes most, all that which exceeds reality. Music is composed to raise us as high as possible above that imagined reality. Third, the singing also serves as a reminder of where God's people have been and where God is currently leading them. You might notice if we take a look at the passage again, verses 4 through 10 talk about the Hebrews' march towards the sea, while verses 13 through 17 act more like a victory parade where God's people march with their champion before all the people of the world, all the people who might seek to oppress them, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Canaanites. But unlike the victory processions of this world that want to show domination and power, God's victory parade is remarkably different. It, it says in verse 13, In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed, and the people trembled. In other words, this hymn wants to demonstrate God's love, not God's power. But until these people can reach their new home where God reigns as king and is sovereign over all of the earth, God will continue to protect the Hebrews as they march before their before their enemies. But until that day, while they're processed in front of all the people who might want to do them harm, all the people who might seek to oppress them, the Hebrews are to remember their exodus through singing and shouts of joy. So long as these people continue to bring out the choirs and shake their tambourines and evoke the memories of their past, what could stop them? Perhaps the greatest threat the Hebrews faced, and us too, is the simple act of forgetting. The Old Testament is filled with stories of the Israelites struggling to remember the God who made a pact with them, who made a covenant, and a group of people who struggle to remember their own history. It captures a group of people who must constantly be reminded of their religious history through songs and feasts and festivals. There are people like us who find themselves pulled by the gods of this world, the gods who want to promise us peace and comfort and wealth. To go back to my earlier analogy with my grandparents, could you imagine the look on my grandparents' faces if I were just to suddenly forget my family history? Imagine the, their shock if I failed to recite where my family came from or the lessons of grit and resilience that have defined our tree for generations. Perhaps the greatest gift that our grandparents bring us is the ability to transform the stories of yesteryear and bring them into a present tense. Walter Brueggemann argues that grandparents are the spiritual antidote to the amnesia that grandchildren too readily practice. And after learning more about this song and the dangers of forgetting our history, we can begin to understand why. Our grandparents have good reason to, to fear us grandchildren and that we might fall into some kind of amnesia. Each generation is presented with something fast and new and promising. Just this week, I read a story of a Jewish man who planned a three-month biking trip from Southern California all the way up to the northern part of Maine. Along the way, he asked acquaintances if he could stay the night as he made his way across country. And one family opened their home for the night where at dinner he recounted his travels and how difficult it had been 
for him to find a place to stay. Sometimes he had to pay top dollar for last minute hotel stays. The next day after breakfast, he posted in a Jewish chat that he'd be stopping in Detroit and would like a place to stay. And within the hour, the man had over 15 offers to lodge with these strangers. The host said, wow, I I can't believe how quickly you were able to find a place after what you were just telling us at dinner. To, To which the Jewish man responded, us Jews are sympathetic to travelers and exiles. It's something that's hard for us to forget because we're always confronted with that every time we're together. It's our spiritual ancestors' hope that we hold tightly to this song, that we are molded by the powerful memories of our exoduses, that we sing and remember God's faithfulness in whatever circumstances. But it's, it's hard not to imagine our grandparents' worst fears coming to light. Imagine, if you can, a world that is flattened and despairing, a world fixated on efficiency. Imagine, if you can, a society with no righteous anger, no freedom fighters to call to our attention the mistreatment and injustices of this world based off of some silly categories we might construct. Imagine a world that settles in complacency and is unwilling to risk going against the pharaohs of this world. Imagine a world with no Sabbath, no freedom, no justice, no peace. There are no Passovers in sight, no exoduses through gaping seas. Forget any real singing, any shouts of hallelujah, because those are being deafened by the clopping hooves of the Pharaoh's chariots. If we forget the song, we settle into communities of conflict where we are unaware and numbed to fighting against, fighting against conflict and settling into that new reality. If we forget the song, we receive a society that sees impossible brick quotas as a normal standard of living, where we live to work, and we know that that can never satisfy. Forget the song, and we instead become incapable of wondering, imagining, challenging, or doubting, not bold enough to ask God for water-splitting miracles. Instead, let's adopt a spirituality that demands no commitment from us, Let's crave nostalgia and refuse to dare to imagine a better future for our children or for our grandchildren. Instead, let's bow down to the robotic securities that the gods of consumerism, wealth, and Christian nationalism promise us. Let's find salvation in the golden donkey or the elephant idols. And let's find false comfort in pithy political slogans. My friends, if we forget the song, we end lost, dominated, numbed, and dead. But the good news is that this world, this world our grandparents fear that each generation is presented with, it does not need to be so. We don't need to settle for the way that things have always been. Let's listen and take hope from the prophet of Isaiah when he writes, and and this is from the message, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I am about to do something brand new. It's bursting at the seams. Do you see it? There it is. I am making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. God is in the business of doing something new. And God is always at work bringing about new exoduses to shake us awake from the dull and dead end vision of the secular world into a creative one where bushes actually burn and slaves have the hope of being set free. Yes, we we have to come here and remember, we have to take part of the singing and coming into the sanctuary and remembering our past, but we just, we don't do this for ritual's sake. We sing so that the song seeps into our very character and is woven into the very fabric of who we are. But with each generation, the church finds itself stuck in amnesia, needing to be woken up. And today, the church finds itself stuck between the drudgery of American consumerism and the false hope of Christian nationalism. 
to that fear of forgetting our history, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ reminds us, do this in remembrance of me. Sing and remember. Worship and remember. My friends, Miriam waits for you with a tambourine in hand, begging us to go about setting captives free. May we all be guided by the Spirit as we dare to live differently, be bold and creative in our imagining, and may we worship defiantly before all the pharaohs and all the gods of Egypt. Gracious God, help us remember that your spirit is wild and at loose, bringing about new exoduses and shaping new communities in ways that bring you joy. Embolden us to join together in that new song. Amen.
Please be seated. We're thankful for Carlo for reminding us to sing that song that gives us hope from the past, the present, and the future. Let us pray. Abba, Father, it is the name, O God, that Jesus taught his followers to call you. It is so different from King of Kings. It's such a different name from Lord God Almighty and all the other names by which you were known in the past. Abba, Father, it breathes a sense of care, of personal recognition, of relationship. It reminds us of your tender interest in everything about us, our health, our happiness, our behavior, our fulfillment as persons. We thank you, dear God, for this revelation about you. And we thank you for the way it honors our earthly fathers as well. Earthly fathers who are not as perfect as you, who sometimes uh, they ignore us or abuse us or behave shamelessly. But we are grateful for them and acknowledge that they could never be completely like you. Bless all the fathers who are here today, we pray, and grant them a sense of their importance in our lives and the lives of their children. Let them recognize the mystery in which we all live, a mystery in which we are bound up with you and with one another. And let it inspire them to live joyfully and responsibly before you. We pray for fathers around the world and ask that they may be filled with your spirit, to be sensitive to all those depending on them. Teach us to get up every day with a feeling of confidence because we are living in our Father's world and to know that our Father really cares for us, whatever we are saying or doing. For you are truly our heavenly parent and we are your children forever and ever. And now, Abba Father, as we pray, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is a blessing to be able to give, and we give thanks for the ability to do so. We give asking God to multiply what we do, just like that little boy with the sack lunch of loaves and fishes that was multiplied to feed thousands. Let us now give our gifts to God.
The cattle on a thousand hills are yours, O God, and the diamonds in a thousand mines, and the oil in a thousand wells. So are the homes we live in and the land we live on and the income with which we buy our food. We thank you for what we have by sharing it now with others in the world through the work and ministry of this church in your kingdom. Amen. Membership at First Central Presbyterian is open to all of those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you wish to become a member or are more interested, please talk to Cliff after the service. In C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew, 
Lewis talks about how Aslan the lion went about the creation of Narnia. He didn't roar, nor gesture, nor speak it into existence. Instead, Aslan the great lion sang. It goes without saying that singing has a profound impact in how we worship and has the ability to transform us into something brand new. So my friends, may we sing and remember what God has done. Sing and remember what God is doing. And may we sing and remember that God is not finished yet. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.